James Version. Again, John 21, verses 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Thank you, Brother Tom, so much, and so grateful to be able to assemble here this morning together. And what a blessing it is to have studied the lessons we were able to study this week as we were looking at living in harmony with one another. And we spent some time together in our Bible class this morning, specifically diving into uh, Romans chapter 12 and looking there at the entire passage of verse 16 in the context of what were provided there. I, sorry, in the back, I have my mic on now. I didn't have it on before, but it is on now. I thought I had it on. I didn't click it far enough. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 16 reads for us there in the English Standard Version, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. And we were also talking about uh, in the King James and the New King James, we find uh, additional uh, viewpoints as it relates to the translation and different uh, understandings that we can mine out from this verse particularly. Uh, for example, the New King James says in Romans 12 and verse 16, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. King James there states in verse 16, rather than humble, it associates, uh, uh, it refers to the humble being as low estate. Associate those with, the, with of those of low estate. And then the end there, verse 16, do not be wise in your own opinion, the New King James Version states. And so we think about this passage and we think about this series of lessons we've studied this week, living in harmony with one another. Getting that, of course, from the English Standard Version of Romans 12 and verse 16. Uh, the same idea there in the King James, the New King James, uh, being of the same mind toward one another. Uh, do not setting your mind on high things, associating with those of low estate. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And really the totality, not only of that particular verse, but of the overall context, giving us here an understanding as it relates to how we can serve God in the church, how we can glorify God in the church. And when you really pack together these verses in this context, you understand how harmony is achieved, and a lot of it has to do with the way in which we seek to uh, perceive our very own state, our very own selves, as it relates to our relationship with others, and as it relates ultimately to our relationship with with God. And we were talking a lot in Bible class, this understanding of harmony, when you think about harmony that is achieved in an orchestra, for example, or during a band concert, and different aspects that would be needed in order for a band concert or a, an orchestra of some kind to be carried out successfully. Things such as all looking at the same sheet music, engaged musicians focusing on the production, following the lead of the conductor, all players having a part and yielding their part and their efforts to ultimately achieve the overall performance objectives, and then complaints and distractions being non-existent ultimately for the success of that production. And we were uh, contemplating ways in which you could think about harmony being achieved in an orchestra and harmony being achieved in the church, and again, emphasizing the fact that this isn't optional. This is something that we must intentionally pursue in the church in that we are all striving to be on the same spiritual page in that we are focusing on the authority of God and doing all things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Colossians 3 and verse 17, that the membership, all individual members are fully engaged in focusing on glorifying God. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 the, the ministering that we are engaged in, the service that we are engaged in, is according to the oracles of God and is ultimately seeking to glorify Him, not our very own selves. And that in the church, we are following the lead of Christ who is the head. We're not following any one in particular person. We're not ultimately trying to puff ourselves up and, and follow our own interests and our own Authority, but ultimately the authority, the head, the lead of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4, 
verses 15 through 16, and every single member in the congregation plays a part. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 27, all of us are members individually. We all play a different part that's likened unto the body as a whole. No one part is better than the other, but we all work collectively, collaboratively, ultimately for the glory of God. And we have to focus in on that part that we play and make sure we play it in tune with the rest of the membership to glorify God. And then complaints and disputes, distractions, murmuring. Folks, it's not supposed to exist in the Lord's church. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14, do all things without complaining or disputing. And so you think about an orchestra. I am not musically talented at all, as you all are well aware. I am not able to carry a tune in a bucket. I don't know anything really as it relates to music. I just kind of follow the lead of those who do and try to do my best to glorify God. But I have heard, you have heard, some musical productions attempted that went south, that were not successful. And for all kinds of various reasons, ultimately it sounded poorly. And we have also probably all been aware of orchestra band concert attempts which did go successfully. And only if you were a top dog in the musical industry would you have even maybe been aware of some things that could have been improved on. It sounded beautifully. Well, when we think about the Lord's church and we think about what God has commanded us as it relates to living in harmony with one another on the same page that is the gospel, we need to understand that we are, in many ways, in our service to God and to one another, playing for Him. He is our audience. And if we aren't really engaged, if we're not really paying attention, if we're not really integrated and in tune, if we're not really striving to live our life in accordance with His Word, if we are not doing our very best in coordination with the rest of the membership, then folks, guess what? We're not. Playing for God. We're not producing the most successful production we can be for Him and for His glory. And there are many reasons as to why we maybe fail in living in harmony with one another. But one of the main reasons is because of our lack of understanding as it relates to what it means to love God. And to love one another. Many say that they love God. Do they? Is ignorance of the church. Is ignorance of the membership. Capable. That state. Is it capable in that state. To produce and yield a love. For God. Peter said that he loved God. Tom read just a few minutes ago in the context there of John chapter 21. But God challenged him in that assertion over and over again. Came back continuously with the same message. Love me. Guess what you need to pay attention to? Guess what you need to be aware of? Guess who it is that you need to know and to love the church, the sheepfold. What does it mean to love one another? I mean, that's just such a vague, open, commonly referred to statement and phrase in today's world. So what does it really mean to love one another? I know we are a little early, but let me tell you, there are those in our family who for months have been secretly planning for Mother's Day. They have all kinds of surprises ready to go. To shower Mama with praise and adoration and thanksgiving for her work and her job in the home and in the family nest. I know that it's early. But if we really want to understand 
what it means to love one another, I think we can look at the mother-child relationship and look at a mother's love for her child. When we say a mother loves her child, when a mother knows that she loves her child, how is it that that is defined? How is it that that's understood? What are the different particulars that we can consider so that we can identify that? Because that will help us as we think about that statement and that phrase that we love each other. When a mother loves a child, the mother-child relationship, the love that exists there means that she is aware of how the child prefers to be fed, right? She knows what types of foods that the child likes to eat. She knows how the child likes to eat. Does the child like the airplane? Coming in for a landing. Well, maybe that doesn't work. Maybe the child prefers a different mechanism, a different approach to being fed. The mother even understands when the child wants to be fed. Certain children like to be fed at 1.45 in the morning. Other children, they have their particulars as to whether or not it's when they first wake up or right before they go to bed. And mama knows. She is aware of how the child also prefers to be held. She knows whether or not the child wants to be swaddled, all wrapped up tight in a blanket, not even able to move, whether that child wants to be free-flowing and all able to wail and flail about. What arm is preferred? What position is preferred? Does the child prefer to be rocked or not rocked? She knows. She is aware of the bedtime routine. She knows what kind of books desire to be read or even those picture books, those pictures to be shown. She knows how they are to be read. You'd think maybe children would like books to be read with certain accents or really Investing yourself into the story, but some children, they don't really like that. They want it to be read a certain way. Mama knows. She knows in the bedtime routine whether or not a sippy cup is desired before bed. A sippy cup is desired maybe even right next to the bed. She knows whether or not the child wants a light, a, a light in the room or some kind of night light. Maybe even a sound machine or a fan of some kind. Folks, we could go on and on. But guess what? Mama knows. And that knowledge defines and is aligned with love. Do we love God? Do we know God? Do we know God's sheep? Jesus says, if you love me, feed my sheep. See, Peter thought it was a competition. Peter said, Lord, even if all else forsake you, I will not. See, Lord, I'm the best. I'm first. I'm the greatest. I get the blue ribbon. I get the gold star. I beat everyone else. Peter missed it. Because it was that mentality that caused Peter to stumble. <laughs> Peter didn't comprehend and understand what it meant to truly love and be devoted to God. He thought it was a competition. And so Jesus in what we understand to be the context of restoring Peter in John chapter 21, says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. What do you know about your brethren? Do you know where they work? Do you know their family history? Do you know about their children, about their grandchildren? Do you know where they have lived? 
what they have done throughout their life. When you compare what a mother knows about her child, ask yourself, what do you know about the members of the church? This week's lessons is all about harmony. How can we be harmonious in the Lord without knowing God and loving God, without knowing each other and loving each other? To know and love each other in Christ is to know and love God so as to be harmonious with Him and with one another. Well, preacher, how deep do I really have to go? How much do I really have? It's a lot of work to talk to people, to know people, to hear their stories and what they have to say. Do I really, I mean, I know they're here. I know their name. I'm not sure their last name, but do I need, how deep are we talking? Go back to that mother. And the love that that mother has for the child. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. And when we read this passage, beginning there in verse 14, folks, we cannot walk away from this passage and get the idea that it is acceptable to God for us to live harmonious with one another, for us to be of the same mind, for us to love each other and ultimately to love God without being integrated in the lives of one another via the gospel. Look with me, starting in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 4. Paul writes by inspiration that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Sometimes people get this idea that well, harmony and unity means we don't have to pay attention to the gospel. We can just close the Bible. <laughs> Sometimes even people get the idea that the Bible causes problems. We don't want to get into the weeds of the Scripture. That means we're going to disagree. That means we're going to have issues. Wait a second. God says right here, no, no. You've got to be aware of false doctrine. You're not supposed to be just carried away with everything that you hear. Verse 15, but speaking the truth. The truth is a requirement. In love. Love is a requirement. May grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about brother so-and-so. It's not about elder so-and-so. It's not about the deacon. It's not about this person, that person. It's about Christ. That in the truth, in love, not error, not false doctrine, growing up in him, how so? Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. God says we have to know each other. We have to know each other in the gospel house so just like a body is intertwined together. Functioning in unison so that life is possible. What if your nervous system just decides it doesn't want to participate anymore? Are you going to have a problem? What if your right arm just decided it had a mind of its own, it's no longer going to do any more work? Right arm says, you know what? Left arm doesn't really do much work. I'm the one doing all the work all the time. Those of us who are right-handed, I know we got some left-handed folks in here. But those of us who are right-handed, right hand might say, well, I don't want to do any more work. I've been doing too much. What if it just stopped? We're going to have a problem? We need the totality of our body. The systems of our body 
all the roots and aspects that make up our physical, personal, actual body to work so that ultimate health can be achieved. And when it doesn't, when there's a problem, guess what? We're all well aware of the issues that arise. There's complications. What is the health of the church? Brother or sister, if you're not ingrained with the church, we're unhealthy. We're missing you. If you're not in tune, if you're not playing, if you're not participating, engaged, collaborating, aware of everyone else's part and your part as well, we're unhealthy. We don't want to be that way. We want to be harmonious, glorifying God in the gospel. Now, how are we going to get there? How are we going to get to the point where we know each other likened unto a mother knowing that child so that we can love each other likened unto a mother loving that child? Well, for God, for Him, we make an effort to get to know brethren that we do not know. You might say, well, I'm nervous and I'm uncomfortable. I'm not very used to putting myself out there. I, I struggle. You can write them a card. You can send them a text message. You can check in on them. You can ask them questions. You can give them a call. You can pray about it. You can then work toward it. And then you can pray about it and about them as you get to know them. And if you allow your prayer life to be your motivator so that you can pray for them, getting to know them will become a lot easier. Hey, I want to get to know this person because based on what I get to know, I'm going to go pray about it. Now, all of a sudden, it's not about me feeling uncomfortable. It's not about, I'm a little nervous here. It's about, you know what? I have a job to do. I want to pray to God. I want to care for this individual. I want to care for brother or sister so-and-so. How can I learn more about who they are so that I can go to God on their behalf? And then guess what? I can follow up. I can let them know of my prayers. I can evaluate the strength of my bond with my brother. Is it rooted in the gospel truth? Is it just surface level or is it rooted deeply? You might ask yourself, well, how am I supposed to know that answer? Here's a way to think of it. Have you ever been in a situation where someone has gotten into a car accident that you were accountable to and responsible for and, and with in some kind of way? And you found yourself showing up at the hospital or you found yourself engaged with the particulars of, of this emergency and you all of a sudden realize you have no idea who this person is. Brother so-and-so is there at the hospital. Sister so-and-so is on her way from such and such a state. You learn all of a sudden of their job. You learn of their financial situation. You learn of previous health complications they have. And all of a sudden you realize, I had absolutely no idea who this person was. get there now. Let's not wait on a car accident. Let's make the decision today to intentionally, purposefully get to know one another, to improve our relationships with one another, to love one another so that we might know and love God. What else can we do? We can consider how to collaborate with our brethren to grow in our bond and our love in Christ. Think about this. When you work together, you learn together, right? You're working on a particular task. It may be a task you've done a bazillion times, but you work now with someone else on that particular task. Guess what? You learn about that person. That person learns about you. And you learn about whatever the task is that you're doing, no matter how many times you've done it, together. So you work together, you learn together. When you learn together, you start to love together. When you love together, you start to grow together. Uh, friends and brethren, this idea that I can love and know God and I don't need to have anything to do with the church, it's not biblical. It is absolutely not biblical. As a matter of fact, if you want a litmus test as to how deep your love is for God, ask yourself, how deep is your love for the church?
What are the outcomes when we begin to live harmoniously with one another, loving one another in the gospel? What does it achieve? As we know, know, know more and more and more about each other and love, love, love more, more, more each other, we get to experience the outcomes and the consequences of harmony. What are those outcomes? Well, number one, congregational connectedness. Congregational connectedness. In other words, it's a, it's a running story. It's a running story. Have you ever picked up a season of some kind of sitcom, some kind of show, and you watch some episode and you think, I, I don't have any idea what's going on. Hannah and I are huge Blue Bloods fans. You may not be. There's a denominationalism in there, and there's other problems that certainly arise that we would in no way recommend or align ourselves to. But by and large, the show is one of the more moral sitcoms, dramas, crime-type investigation shows that exist in television. And it actually takes several seasons of watching and kind of getting in tune with what this family is all about before you start realizing why the episodes you would watch five seasons into it are the way that they are. But if you just pick up on that one episode, you may not really know what's going on. And so the question is, what is our congregational connectedness? What do we know about each other? What do we understand about each other? If we had to take a quiz on brother or sister so-and-so, what would we be able to write down? Now, the first century church, they were in tune. They were performing a beautiful orchestra, a beautiful production for the glory of God. In that the life they were living, serving one another in the church, Glorified God. We find in Acts chapter 21, for example, in verse 5, Paul here is in Tyre, and Luke is writing, he says, When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way, and they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. Folks, they were in tune and connected with one another. You look here in the same exact chapter. Notice verse 17. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The church is activated. They're aware of what's going on. Their pulse is on the work of the gospel spreading in the first century. You look at Acts chapter 28. Notice here in verse 14. Where we found brethren and were invited to stay with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And from there, when the brethren heard about us, they came to meet us as far as Happy for them. And three ends. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. They're in tune with what's going on. You even find in the book of Colossians, as Paul is writing here, regarding those that would serve and minister unto the congregation, regarding those that also were serving and ministering unto him. In Colossians chapter 4, and in verse 7, he says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. In other words, there's a depth of knowledge, a depth of understanding, a depth in this relationship that is being pursued and that is known. And so what is an outcome of harmony? What is an outcome of knowing each other, loving each other in the gospel? Congregational connectedness, but also evangelistic effectiveness evangelistic effectiveness. Yes, when we are living in harmony with one another, knowing one another, loving one another in the gospel, guess what? We're evangelizing just by our relationships that we have with one another. Jesus says in John 17, beginning there in verse 20, he says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 
Jesus is praying here for unity in the gospel, unity with the Father, unity with him and the Father and with the brethren. And that when such is achieved and lived, the world sees a difference. The world sees distinctiveness. Congregational connectedness, evangelistic effectiveness, and finally, personal peace. Personal peace. I think sometimes the reason why we are hesitant to engage and invest in the lives of others is because we're protecting ourselves. What do we say? I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. Why do we say that? I start to get involved and I start to know what's going on and then I start to care. Now I start to feel somewhat responsible. Now I start to put forth effort. Guess what? We know the pain that sometimes that brings about. We know that sometimes things go south, they go sideways, and all of a sudden what we thought initially going into it has become something totally different, and we feel exposed and vulnerable and all of a sudden hurt. And so sometimes we guard ourselves because we think, wait a second, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to invest. I don't want to care because when I care, I might get hurt. Folks, I have a question. What if God didn't care for you? You wouldn't have woken up this morning. If God didn't care for you, we wouldn't have the gospel. If God didn't care for you, the church would have never been built and we wouldn't have hope. How far did he put himself out there? To the cross. He expects nothing less than us. A servant is not greater than his master. And look what our master did. Guess what? Folks, when we think about, I might get hurt, we need to understand, that's a part of the job description. (laughs) That's a part of what it means to be a Christian. We are so confident, we are so deep-rooted in our relationship with God because of the love and the example that he has shown us. We are okay putting ourselves out there knowing the pain that might come. Because ultimately, our strength, our peace is with God. So guess what? I can take it. James tells us in James chapter 1, beginning there in verse 19, he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. When we listen, when we feast upon the word of God, when we feast upon the gospel in action, which is the church in fellowship and in collaboration for the glory of God, then we are able to be wise. We are able to have our souls saved. We are able to be at peace with others. And be in harmony. I have a question. As we think about this lesson. And this series of lessons this week. Here's where we're going to start. Number one. Are you in harmony with God? Here's the deal. Christ is the propitiation. For our sins. He's the atonement. For our sins. What that means is. When we have sinned, we've done so because we've committed lawlessness. We've transgressed the law of God. 1 John 3 and verse 4. Therefore, the wrath of God is set on us. The sacrifice of Christ makes it possible to have that wrath satisfied. So my first question is, are you in harmony with God or is his wrath 
still set on you. You have to start there. To be in harmony with God means we are a child of God. It means we've made the decision to be baptized into Christ, putting on Christ via baptism. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Have you done that yet this morning? If not, make the decision to be right with God first. Allow that wrath to be satisfied via the atoning blood of Jesus Christ as you access it via the gospel. Via obedience to the gospel, the requirement for eternal salvation, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Done via baptism, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Have you done that yet this morning? If not, you have the opportunity. Brother or sister, have you left your harmonious relationship with Christ and instead pursued harmony with the world? Now you know, you know, that's a losing battle. It will never happen. Even if you did everything